Our second scripture reading is also from the New Testament, from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. I shall be reading chapter 3, the second half of verse 4 through verse 16. Again, listen to the word of God. Paul writes, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead." Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus." Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. In the year 1896, Charles Sheldon wrote a book that is now considered a Christian classic. It's one of the best-selling books of all time. The statistics I found were that over 30 million copies of this book have been sold. It's called In His Steps, and it's the story of a small-town church that was kind of moving on momentum on inertia. They were kind of resting on their laurels as believers. Until one Sunday morning during worship, a hobo who had come to the church during that week and had been turned away showed up in the sanctuary and publicly rebuked the people of the congregation for refusing to help him before falling over and dying right there on the sanctuary floor. As you can imagine, that caused a little bit of a stir in the church, and it sent them into a season of taking stock of who they were and of how they made their decisions. And eventually, the church, being led by the pastor, came together and made a pact that for the next year, each one of them in the congregation individually and the church corporately as a whole would not make any major decisions without first asking a single question, what would Jesus do? In this situation, what would Jesus do? What decision would Jesus make? And as you can imagine, with this much of a change in the people of the congregation, the town that the church was in began to take notice, and the town began to give a great deal of pushback. The people of the church and the church as a whole got a lot of flack for the decisions that they ended up making after asking this particular question, what would Jesus do? But in the end, the congregation is, of course, stronger, victorious, because of this change that has come over them, and the gospel ends up spreading to places and to people that no one ever thought it would ever go. In the recent past, 
particularly beginning in the 1990s, that question that Charles Sheldon first brought to the church's attention in his book came back into fashion, usually uh, abbreviated WWJD, what would Jesus do? At college where I went, they, they made it mean what, who would Jesus date? But we were just uh, having fun with that, WWJD, what would Jesus drive? You know, those are the, the, what we did. But everybody at my college had these bracelets on that said WWJD on them. You can still buy them in the Christian bookstores. You can get t-shirts with WWJD on them. You can get bumper stickers, all kinds of swag with WWJD printed on it. And that book and this WWJD movement have helped a lot of Christians over the years making major decisions by framing it in this particular way. What would Jesus do in this situation? But there's a problem with WWJD. It's the wrong question to ask. Now, I'm not denying that a lot of people have been helped by asking this question. I'm not saying we shouldn't ask this question from now or time and again. Still, overall, I think WWJD is the wrong question to ask because notice what is implied in this statement. What would Jesus do if he were here? What would Jesus do if he were alive? you see the presuppositions that that question is making, presupposing that Jesus is not here at this time, that Jesus is not alive, that Jesus is not active and at work in our lives, assuming that Jesus is up there somewhere, far removed from us, and that our Christian faith is simply a story that we tell to each other, a set of commandments that we try to keep, a set of rules that we try to follow, that The man, Jesus, that we read about is no more than some moral influence on our life, no more than some pattern that we are trying to follow, some pattern that we are trying to emulate. WWJD, I think, taken to its logical extreme, can lead to so many of the problems that we have in the American church today that we simply go on living our lives and we stuff a little bit of Jesus in here and there wherever he seems to fit or whenever we have a crisis, or whenever we have a big decision to make. I think if we look at our scriptures for today, however, we find Jesus is so much more than that. Jesus is so much greater than that. I think our scriptures today teach us that the question we should be asking is not WWJD, what would Jesus do? if he were here, but W-I-J-D, what is Jesus doing? Because he is here. He is alive. He is at work in our world. He is at work in our church. He is at work in our lives. As the choir just sang, we are standing on holy ground. And what makes that ground holy, not us, not the windows, not the carpet, not the brass up front, what makes that ground holy is Jesus Christ is here right now, and we are united to him in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is Eastertide, the season we especially remember. We serve a God who is alive, a living, resurrected Lord, not some dead moral influence, not just a story, not just a set of teachings that we study, but a Lord who is alive and at work in our lives. And every single day, the question we need to be asking is, what is Jesus doing today? And how do I get on board? How do I get on board and participate in the work that Jesus is doing here in my life today? Something we too often forget is that the God we serve is a personal God, a God who desires to be in relationship with us. 
And so often if we listen to the way people talk, they imagine God as far away, removed. Bette Midler sang a song, ugh, a horrible song, but a lot of people like it, from a distance, God is watching us. From a distance, no, God's not at a distance. God's not far away from us. God is here among us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And throughout the scriptures, we see examples of God invading the lives of his people and meddling in the lives of his people and not leaving them alone. Phyllis read for us one of the most powerful stories of that, the conversion of the Apostle Paul. As he traveled on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, he was going there, by the way, to arrest a bunch of Christians in this new Jesus church movement that had sprung up. Jesus had ascended to the Father at this point. This is after the resurrection, after the ascension, after Pentecost. And yet, as Saul traveled along the road there, he had a vision. The living Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to him and literally knocked him on his behind in the middle of the road and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This is the kind of Jesus that we worship, folks. This is the kind of Jesus we serve. He's not from a distance. He's not far away. He breaks into our lives. And through this encounter with Jesus, through this meeting the risen Jesus and being knocked on his behind and being struck blind for three days and having to be led into Damascus and being ministered to by Ananias... Jesus took Saul, the great enemy of the church, Saul, the number one opponent of Jesus Christ, and transformed him into the apostle Paul, one of the church's greatest servants. Paul, one of the greatest lovers of Jesus Christ. What is Jesus doing? He's still doing things like this. He's still in the business of changing lives. He's still in the business of transforming people and changing people from within. And in our second reading for today, as Paul writes to the Philippians, he tells the Philippian believers what that experience is like of being transformed, of having his life turned absolutely upside down. Paul gives his testimony And he says, it's really interesting how he puts this, basically, before I met Jesus, I had it all. Before I met Jesus, I had the good life, folks, Paul says. He said, I had the right bloodline, I had the right family ties, I had the best education that anyone could get in Jerusalem at that time, I had my life in order, I had I was one of the most zealous servants of God. I was an opponent of that new Jesus church movement that was going around. I was a Pharisee. I had done everything that I could do with my life. My life was good. And yet, he says, I was morally and spiritually bankrupt until I met the risen Lord on that road to Damascus, until Jesus invaded my life and began to meddle and turn everything upside down. He says, now, whatever gain I had, all of those good things that I had in my life, I count them as loss. I move them from the plus column to the minus column on the balance sheet for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For this sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Now, this is, a, this is pretty important, folks. This is pretty powerful stuff that Paul is saying. He said, all of those things that I used to think were so incredibly important, 
all of those things that I used to live my life for, that I used to wrap myself in, all of my accomplishments, all of the good things in my life, my bloodline, my family, my education, my credentials, my good works. He said, compared to knowing Jesus Christ, compared to having a relationship with Jesus Christ, compared to Jesus breaking into my life and grabbing hold of me, all of that other stuff is rubbish. And that's a pretty strong word in the Greek, and that's a pretty terrible translation of the word. Actually, the word that Paul uses is a swear word, a vulgarity. And there's kids here, so I can't really tell you exactly what it means. But let's say there's two ways you can translate it. First, that which you throw to the dogs. Or second, a word several levels above refuse, dung. If you don't understand, I'll draw you a picture afterwards. It's a word I can't say from the pulpit. That's what, G, that's what Paul is calling all of that stuff that he used to think were the most important things in his life. He says, compared to knowing Jesus Christ, that's what I think of all of that other stuff. Knowing Jesus is so incredibly good and powerful and wonderful that all of those other things that I used to fill my life up with are like that, refuse compared to Jesus Christ. And I want to know Jesus, Paul says. Notice he doesn't say know about Jesus. Like we would say, I want to know about Abraham Lincoln. I want to know more about Cleopatra. See, we can't know Abraham Lincoln anymore. We can't know Cleopatra anymore. We can know about them. We can know what people have written about them. We can learn more facts about their lives. We can't know Abraham Lincoln anymore. He's dead. We can't know Cleopatra anymore. She's long gone. But we can know Jesus Christ. He's not dead. He rose again from the dead. He's alive. He is active right now in our world. He is active right now in our lives and in our church. And Paul says, I want to know Jesus Christ, the same Jesus who knocked me on my behind on that road to Damascus. Do you understand what Paul is talking about? Do you have that same passion, that same zeal in your life to know Jesus? Do you want to know this Jesus so much to experience the power and the love of Jesus Christ so much that you're willing to give up anything and everything to make that happen? Because that's what Paul is talking about here, and that's what he's calling us the way he's calling us to live. But before you begin to feel too guilty here, because not having the same passion and zeal in your life that Paul did, let me be quick to point out, Paul also says here, this is not completely up to us. And here's Here's sometimes where WWJD can lead us astray. Because WWJD, what would Jesus do? Oh, I've got to do what Jesus would do. I've got to get myself the way that Jesus would get himself. I've got to get my attitude the way Jesus' attitude is. I've got to live my life the way he would live. If you get into that mindset, and so many of us have, we think, well, it's up to me to will up this passion, to will up this zeal, to try to get myself to have this desire that Paul had to know Jesus Christ. And I don't think that message is at all helpful. Because if you're like me, you've tried to live this before. You've asked over and over again, what would Jesus do? And you've tried to go out and do it. As one preacher friend of mine called it, he said, the message that so often is preached is you need to go out and get exhausted for Jesus. I've gone out and gotten exhausted for Jesus. Guess what? It still didn't feel like I was doing enough. I've gone out and I've worn myself out for Jesus, and guess what? I still didn't get it all right. I can't live the way Jesus lived. I've tried. I don't have the power. 
on my own, I don't have the power to live the way Jesus lived. I don't have the wisdom to make the decisions that Jesus would make all the time. I try. I wear myself out. I can't do it. But look at what Paul says here. Not that I have already obtained this, Not that I am already perfect in this, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul says here something really powerful. He says he presses on. He does the hard work, and it is hard work sometimes. He strains at it. You get a picture of a runner running a race and straining hard to try and reach that finish line. He presses on, but he presses on to make Jesus his own because Jesus has already made Paul his own. He grabs a hold of Jesus in response to the fact that Jesus has already grabbed a hold of him. And the image I get as I try and figure that out is of a parent leaning over and picking up a child and the child wiggling and kicking and struggling over and over again until they finally realize I am safe in mom's arms, I am safe in dad's arms, so I'm going to grab a hold of mommy or daddy. Because mommy or daddy has already grabbed a hold of me and picked me up. It's a powerful image. God has grabbed a hold of us. As a preacher a friend of mine says, grabbed a hold of us by the scruff of our spiritual necks. He's reached down. It's a violent word in the Greek. He's grabbed us, seized us, snatched us. And as we are in his arms and in his hands, we respond by grabbing a hold of him. It's a powerful thing that Paul is saying here. This is what we're talking about. God is a living, active, powerful, dynamic, loving God. And he's grabbed a hold of us and he's never letting go. And the question we need to be asking is, what is he doing? He's not just a guy up there far away. It's not just a set of teachings we read, although we read them and we study them and we try to follow them. He's not just a pattern that we pattern our lives after, although we do, and that's helpful sometimes. But so much more than that, he is a living, active God, and he has a plan for each one of us. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him. All that we are and all that we have are his. So what is he up to? What is his plan for our lives? What is his plan for our church? What is his plan for our world? Are we paying attention to that? Are we listening to that? Are we grabbing a hold of it and participating in that and saying, Lord, you have the power, you have the vision, and whatever you want for me, whatever you want for my church, whatever you want for my world, I'm going to get involved in that because I know it's going to be good. And this is the same Jesus who grabbed a hold of Saul, the great enemy of church, and that transformed him into the apostle Paul, the great missionary to the Gentiles. This is the same Jesus who preached a gospel that turned the world upside down, who is alive and active right here, right now at work in our world. And he has the power to work miracles. He has the power to change lives. He can empower us to get rid of that habit that we have been trying to break for years and just don't seem to get any traction on. He has the power to transform that person that you stay up nights worrying about what's going to happen to them and to transform their hearts and minds and bring them back to the straight and narrow. He can heal our diseases. He can take our guilt and our shame and our burdens and all of that emotional baggage we carry around with us and cast it away from us as far as the east is from the west. And he can take us, the fearful, fretful, stubborn, worrisome people that we are, and use us for great and mighty things, just as he did the Old Testament saints and the disciples and the New Testament church, who, by the way, were just as fearful, fretful, stubborn, timid, and worrisome as we are. 
This is the same Jesus we are talking about here, the one who changes hearts, the one who makes enemies into friends, the one who gives beauty for ashes, the one who takes unlovely people like us and makes us into lovely people again, the one who makes everything sad come untrue, the one who sends us forth as his ambassadors, his hands and feet in the world. The question is, what is Jesus doing right now in our lives, in our church, in our world? And how are we going to get on board? Because he's grabbed a hold of us by the scruff of our spiritual necks. We're his. He's not going to let us go. And he has great plans for our lives. He loves us with a fierce and passionate love. He wants only good things for us. But are we paying attention? And are we seeking Him with all of our hearts and minds? Are we seeking His will for our church? Are we going to stop wiggling and kicking and try to get away from Him and lean into Him and grab a hold of Him and realize we are safe in His arms? And are we seeking to know Him to really know him? Are we willing to give anything and everything to truly have a relationship with him? For he's here right now. And he desires great things for us. So let's grab a hold of him, folks. And let's participate in whatever it is that he wants for us. For he has grabbed a hold of us. And he is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To him alone be the glory. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a living Lord. We thank you that you care enough about us to be at work in our lives and our church. And we pray, Lord, for wisdom. We pray for insight. We pray for the passion and zeal to seek you with our whole being. We pray that we would come to know you and love you and live for you. And Lord, as we prepare to come to your table and commune with you, we ask for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.